world now. Um, and, and the situation and the results of uh, investment of all types, of foreign investment of all types, previously in the colonial period and in the apartheid period, led to the formation of cheap labor systems of utter brutality and super exploitation of indigenous workers. And now we thought that period might have brought, been brought to a close with the political independence of African countries and resistance in, in other countries, you know, other areas such as Latin America. Unfortunately, we found that the policies of uh, the employers of Chinese investment, Chinese national companies, are even far worse than the uh, multinationals, which have not been in any, in any way uh, pro-worker. Uh, and we've seen in particular in relation to Rossing, the miners have, have risen out of a period of apartheid to real brutal labor conditions in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And now after a period of some relief uh, with political independence and labor laws, which are meant to be on their side, are now finding that their unions are being crushed all over again, uh, this time uh, with the uh, movement of uh, Chinese employers. So we want to explore that particular situation and build solidarity with the Rossing workers. And then, um, and broadly, you know, I was very pleased that Patrick could uh, participate, because Patrick's been making a study of Chinese investment, uh, the conditions on which it's taking place, and the conditions which are, you know, being dished out uh, to workers and the comprador uh, nature of states in response, you know, to such investment. So let's uh, hear Patrick first. And then I hope that we'll be able to hear one of the workers that is uh, George Martins, a leading worker from Rossing, and hear him, the, the voice of the workers directly uh, from Namibia. Uh, thank you. Patrick, over to you. Mm. Uh, thanks, Comrade David. I'm going to jump right in. I'll introduce myself because uh, some of the writing, including a study uh, in 2021 that helped set the stage, uh, are published at the Committee for the Abolition of Third World debt, um, cadtm.org. Um, and I've also been debating the character of, of Chinese capitalism with Michael Hudson at uh, the analysis um, dot uh, news. And that's a, a Canadian based television station that Paul J uh, hosts. If you're interested in the deeper, you know, the evidence and all, but I thought I would just give a, a bit of that context and then a few other examples so that Rossing uranium comes into focus. Uh, I think I always when I'm talking about Chinese investment, I start with the uh, most um, admirable component, Amazing. namely um, Zhou Enlai's eight principles for Chinese interrelations with Africa. And that was in a trip about 20 years ago that uh, Zhou took to uh, especially Tanzania and Zambia, where the big railroad that um, helped to avoid Zambia's dependence upon uh, apartheid South Africa was was uh, built by Chinese workers at, at great cost. Um, it was a very difficult um, enterprise, many died. But what the eight principles that came through at the time were, first, mutual benefit, second, no conditions attached, third, no interest or low interest loans would not create a debt burden, fourth, to help the recipient nation develop its economy and not to create dependence on China. Fifth, to help the recipient country with projects that need less capital and quick returns. And uh, seventh, the aid in kind must be high quality at the world market price to ensure that um, the technology is mastered by locals. And finally, Chinese experts and technicians working for the aid recipient country are treated equally with local ones with no extra benefits. So those are eight principles that came from Zhou um, Enlai uh, from his trip uh, 60 years ago. That's, I think, what solidaristic, uh, comradely, uh, uh, developmental uh, investment might look like. We've seen the opposite. Um, let me quickly mention that uh, there's, as David was saying, a tradition of super exploitation in China. The Hoku system, which is very uh, similar to what he said as the uh, uh, sort of uh, relationship of urban uh, to urban capital to rural workforce, in which the rural uh, worker comes to the city as a second class citizen. And the women, especially in the rural areas, are responsible for reproducing that worker uh, at a much lower cost, hence a lower wage rate. And that's been quite central to uh, Chinese capital accumulation. But in turn, along with the a drive to uh, 
uh, invest in uh, very, very uh, high capital intensive uh, production systems. Their reinvestment rates around 40%. I mean, it's been a, an extraordinary period of capital accumulation. The result is the overaccumulation crisis that led to, um, in the 2008-9 crash, a reassessment in which the infrastructural investments took uh, a, a higher priority. And it's that capitalist crisis with its spatial fix, its geographical solution, or at least resolution, or if not that displacement of the problem that we look at now. And that's the going out system in which especially Chinese industrial capital and the extractive industries really were much more focused on especially getting uh, the African uh, raw materials, the minerals, the uh, cash crops, the uh, fossil fuels. And therefore, much of our infrastructural investment has been aimed in that way. So let me give you that as my uh, opening thesis, the, the theory of uneven and combined development in which, uh, the, as Rosa Luxemburg put it so long ago, um, the capitalist crisis tendencies then lead to um, this extraction. The sound you're hearing are the um, awful Johannesburg birds, uh, the Hadida. It's not a little baby in the background being tortured, don't worry. Now, let me give you some empirical sites, and uh, David and the comrades in Namibia will then put grossing uranium into this context. I'll give you some of the most uh, excruciating examples in which this going out of Chinese capital facing this overaccumulation crisis has really affected um, our own realities of uh, maldevelopment and, and dependency. Uh, so let me give you uh, about 10 quick examples. First, <clears throat> there's a company in uh, Beijing, China South Rail, um, it's changed its name, but that's that's what we know it as, that provided over a thousand locomotives to South Africa and with China, China Development Bank financing. The amount of money involved has been estimated at $5 billion. I'll be using dollar, but Obviously, it's in local currency. And unfortunately, that money was rooted through a corrupt network called the Guptas and a vast markup on those locomotives and inappropriate. Um, let's say the locomotives were used for coal exports mainly. And then they started to break down. And as the corruption of the Guptas began to come to light and they were pushed out and their main political sponsor, Jacob Zuma, the president, was pushed out. Then the new uh, Transnet board tried to get uh, some of the money back from China South Rail. And that led to the kind of crisis that uh, pleases me to some extent because uh, China South Rail refused to provide locomotive parts. And this is for export of coal, much of which now goes to China, not just India and a little bit now to Europe. Um, it's a, quite an extraordinary problem because this was the single largest coal export terminal in the world, I mean, uh, there's Newcastle in Australia, but but the Richards Bay terminal, the end point of this rail line mm -hmm. has been crippled and it's gone from about um, 70 million, uh, well, in fact, capacity of 90 million down to about um, 58 million tons of coal. That's just one. Now, number two, in the same spirit, China Development Bank, without any ethical sensibility or worry about corruption, began financing the two big electricity uh, production systems called Kusile and Madupi, and especially Kusile, the coal-fired power plant, 4,800 megawatts, the biggest in the world under construction, has had terrible breakdowns, and it was corrupt because the main company building it, Hitachi, had bribed our ruling party, the African National Congress, uh, by giving it 25% of its local shareholding. And that that corruption means what uh, progressives mm -hmm. have argued, including mm -hmm. in the labor movement, is that there should be no uh, repayment of the so-called odious debt. A third would be the Chinese-initiated Messina Mercado Special Economic Zone, which is the uh, $10 billion attempt to do uh, first a 4,600 megawatt coal-fired power plant. That, that's been pushed off uh, the agenda, but major new um, uh, smelters and uh, uh, processing plants for uh, heavy industry, which with the emissions at levels about 10% of the entire country's we hope won't be built. And there's a big contestation of Messina Makata Special Economic Zone. Critical here is that the Chinese, it's, a, it's an entirely Chinese initiative. And the main guy running it, Ning Yat Hoi from Hoi Moor Investments, has been wanted by Interpol for his <laughs> corruption in the uh, uh, Zimbabwean mining industry. And so he was on the red list, but that didn't stop South Africa from just saying, oh yeah, come on in. The fourth okay. is what has now come to light as uh, the CCCC Construction Company, a major, one of the two or three largest really in the world, 
and its um, attempt to do bridge building on the wild coast. The wild coast is our east coast uh, on the Indian Ocean, the, 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 what was known as the trans sky. And there's been amazing contestation by eco-socialists and uh, feminists and, and indigenous folk saying, no, we don't want to see that mining. And, and that toll road and the bridges are particularly for extraction of mining. So that's been a very contentious set of uh, bridges that uh, CCCC just this last week has come under scrutiny in the press for. A fifth would be um, the general way in which China as um, integration of the world economy uh, comes in what I would call using Hoi Mauro Marini's term, sub-imperialism, a role in the international division of labor and the supply chains in which Chinese firms are extracting in the same way the Western multinationals were. And what that means in turn is that the um, minerals value chain creates unequal ecological exchange. So the unequal ecological exchange is the extent to which the um, non-renewable resources of Africa are pulled out of the continent with um, inadequate compensation. What would be adequate compensation? Well, to give you uh, counter examples, I'm thinking of Norwegian oil, which uh, revenues and profits go into the Norwegian state or China, uh, uh, Canadian or Australian capital who um, have mostly local Canadian or Australian shareholders. And as they pull profits from Africa and other places, those go uh, to back into their, their home market. Um, we don't really have any genuine local uh, African mining houses. We used to have a couple. One was called Ashanti in Ghana. It was bought by Anglo. Anglo Gold um, Ashanti is the result. And they've just this last year moved away. Uh, uh, to had, have their financial headquarters in London. And that's left us with practically no indigenous big mining houses. And so when China is a mining, um, you know, uh, and, and mining merchants, along with, you know, obviously Glencore and other Western ones, they are really taking advantage of this renewable resource drain and the inadequate reinvestment. Um, so I'd say that particularly, and um, Samir Amin in his last um, year of writing in 2018, came to this position as well, that it's not just the um, surplus value flows, the unequal exchange of labor power, but also the unequal exchange of, of natural resources that um, can help explain Africa's continual impoverishment and the way imperialism and sub-imperial capital, like Chinese capital or South African capital, then contributes to the looting of this continent. Um, a sixth uh, part of this, or seventh, whichever it is, it's uh, the finance. And I would then point not only to these banks, but to the BRICS New Development Bank, which is Shanghai headquartered. It looks like there'll be a new um, president of the BRICS New Development Bank named Dilma Rousseff. You remember her name in 2016. She was a victim of a coup by the right-wing forces in, in uh, Brazil. And she's now apparently going to move to Shanghai to be the BRICS NDB president. Again, on the CADTM.org website, I've got a long critique of the way the BRICS New Development Bank is not an alternative to the Western imperial financiers, but is a sub-imperial ally. And that was made very clear exactly a year ago in March of 2022, when uh, Putin invaded um, the uh, 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 Ukraine and uh, financial sanctions kicked in. And then um, a lot of banks, including the BRICS New Development Bank and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, immediately cut their ties because they didn't want to be subject to uh, a downgrade by the big uh, New York credit rating agencies. Um, now, number eight, which is the overall role that China has been playing within sub-imperialism and that uh, within the imperial system as a sub-imperial ally in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, very tightly aligned with the United States on two critical questions. Should emissions be cut dramatically to save the planet? And should those who have polluted pay a climate debt? I mean, there are plenty of others, but those are the two big questions. Um, since 2009, when Wen Jibao, the then premier, and Barack Obama sat with Jacob Zuma, with uh, uh, Manmohan Singh from India, and with... Um, uh, Lula from Brazil in the Copenhagen Accord, and they just sat in their little green room and, and made the deal and foisted on the UN. Um, and that deal included inadequate emissions cuts. And then in the Paris Climate Agreement, China very strongly supported the Western position that there be no accountability for pollution, no polluter pays, uh, no reparations or climate debt payments. So that would be just one example where China's role 
in Southern Africa through the UNFCCC, especially this weekend where we've just lost about 500 people thanks to the cyclone Freddy that came through, or I could go through the rain bomb in Durban last year, or cyclone Ide, cyclone Kenneth um, in, in uh, 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 Mozambique that made it the fourth hardest hit country uh, in the world over the, over the past 30 years for, for climate damage. In all these ways, the UNFCCC has been absolutely brutal uh, because of its control by the fossil addicted imperialists and sub-imperialist countries. So I can go on at great length about why the UNFCCC as climate imperialism desperately needs China to continue to be uh, a, a, you know, a laggard on uh, both those questions, cutting emissions. Uh, they're even building new coal-fired power plants at a record rate right now, but also denying the climate debt. Then we could go to the Bretton Woods institutions. This is interesting because there's an Indian who's just been nominated to be the new head of the Bretton Woods, of, of the World Bank. His name is Ajay Banga. And he's been here in South Africa as a predatory a banker through MasterCard in alliance with the company that has raided the um, uh, week, the monthly grants of the poorest people, which is called Net One, and that's a 22% owned subsidiary of the World Bank. So if I go into the World Bank and I look at what um, these characters, and I, mean, I think it's fair to say China will vote for A.J. Banga, nominated uh, last month by Joe Biden to be the replacement for David Malpass as the World Bank president. The IMF, the same. The IMF had a need for recapitalization. It needed more money in 2015. And China ponied up the most and made no demands, for example, for um, Christine Lagarde, the then uh, managing director, to be pushed out. She was convicted of corruption. She was found guilty in the French courts in 2015. In 2016, uh, China continued to support her uh, managing director position. Um, I could go into the WTO, uh, the UN Security Council. Um, there are so many terrains where we see multinational corporate imperialism being supported very firmly by Chinese sub-imperialism. And then I'll very quickly finish by mentioning a couple of, uh, well, more than a couple. There are so many micro cases and the Rossing uh, mine in Namibia will be uh, something we'll, we'll look into great detail, but it's not unusual, the brutal treatment of workers there, uh, even putting aside that, that the uranium we should leave underground uh, for the largest part because it'll go into nuclear uh, energy. But setting that aside, we have Morangay Diamonds in Zimbabwe, which is where the Zimbabwean generals around a guy called Emerson Mnangagwa, another guy called um, uh, Chiangwa, um, Augustine Chiangwa, Chiangwa. Now, uh, today, the, the president and the vice president of the country, um, and they had basically been responsible for killing 800 peasants in November 2008, who were basically doing uh, artisanal, desperate sort of diamond uh, grabbing in the, in the uh, Morangi area. And the Chinese generals came in with a company called Anjin. There was even a, a prior um, uh, looting process by another uh, uh, Chinese uh, um, sort of tycoon. Um, but the point being that that's how uh, even Robert Mugabe got so frustrated that in 2016, he said, we had $15 billion worth of diamonds in Morangi, and we've only found $2 billion of the revenue. That $13 billion, where did it go? And he said, well, we looked east. And uh, this was his his birthday. It was this kind of amazing moment where he said, maybe that was that was a mistake. Um, the, a similar mistake is playing out in the west of Zimbabwe, a place called Wangi, where coal companies, especially Chinese, are moving not only into the town and really destroying local conditions, lots of good organizing and, and activism there, women running some of the, 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 the most impressive campaigns, but also they're even going into the Wangi uh, Nature Reserve, one of Africa's most famous. A third case is the Zambian Copper Belt, where the mines have been, uh, again, brutally exploited by Chinese capital. A fourth is up a little bit north, the Ugandan Tanzanian oil pipeline. So from eastern Uganda to Lake Albert, there's Total Energies, but also a Chinese oil company. And they're in a very, very controversial uh, way, um, arranging a pipeline for the extraction of that oil is being contested mainly against Total Energies. But it reminds us that we also need good allies in Chinese environmental movements to say this is this is a real mistake for uh, Chinese capital to be involved, a, a Chinese state a corporation. Another example of uh, China in the region is the role that they played, um, especially a man called Sam Pa. He was a tycoon I was mentioning in Angola with the corruption of the uh, Dushan. Uh, and then, Patrick, uh, 
I'll, I'll wrap up in about 30 Patrick, seconds. Patrick, just uh, if you could draw to, uh, then we can get Steve coming in. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. 30 more seconds to finish my list. Mozambican uh, blood methane, a Chinese company, is part of the extraction from the fourth largest gas field. Um, final set of problems, the Chinese debt. It is... Um, uh, quite uh, uh, onerous, and it has led to defaults. Uh, Zambia and Ghana have uh, gone into default. Um, and I'll finally mention that um, we do appreciate what Chinese state capital uh, and, and the state uh, as a whole can do if it's um, properly marshaled. I would, for example, say that the exchange controls that were imposed in 2015 and early 2016 against illicit financial flows are the kind of example that we would want to see in Southern Africa. Another case being the muzzling of big data and the banning of cryptocurrencies over the last two or three years. But so those are moments where you can really feel that, that power of the Chinese state against capital. What we really fear though, are forces like the BRICS plus, which will meet in Durban and not only bring in the five BRICS invited by Cyril Ramaphosa, but also a new group. And I'll just finish by naming some of the new uh, uh, countries that are lining up with their uh, tyrannical and mostly carbon addicted leaders joining the BRICS uh, apparently in this next year, um, Saudi Arabia, and Iran, uh, China just, just put a, a little peace deal together uh, last week for those two. Um, UAE hosting the, the next UNFCCC, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Kazakhstan, um, uh, Egypt, Senegal, Nigeria, Indonesia, and I've just labeled um, uh, tyrannical and carbon addicted. There are a few others, Nicaragua, um, Argentina, uh, Thailand, but um, what you're getting a sense of, I think, is that here in Southern Africa, and particularly in Durban in August, we'll see the role of Chinese capital and the Chinese foreign policy influence in our region at a very high pitch, and it may have implications much more broadly for those of us hoping for a sane future for geopolitical um, calming and for economic justice. We're not going to get that through uh, Chinese investment in Southern Africa as we see it so far. Thanks, comrades. Thanks uh, for a marvelous introduction and the, you know, the general setting and particularly for uh, bringing up the issue of BRICS, which is an alignment of uh, Russia, China, India, as Brazil. To run the video now, if you could start at about 14, uh, in other words, 14 minutes in, and uh, then we can hear George. Can we do I, that? I have, mm. I have to be able to use the screen. The, the, the okay. Same sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Please, Roger, if you... Yeah, 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 I'll do that. Yeah, yeah. By the way, um, Steve has done a number of interviews with uh, with George. Uh, so the Russian case is quite well documented, but it'll be marvelous if we could get the specific interview I did with George. Uh, okay. which puts puts the yeah. word out there. That's it. Thank you, Steve. Our extended families and friends that we used to support have suffered immensely. We've been like running the 100 meters and you're running backwards. You're not accomplishing your, your goal line. So that is the foremost thing. And we are still, since the day that we were dismissed, those are the things that we will fight for. Uh, we are fighting to get our jobs back because we are saying that uh, we were dismissed uh, because at the final letter that we got, uh, it says that we are dismissed because of being part of the union. And I, 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 there's nothing in our constitution that, that, that denies us that right of being part of the union. So. I'm saying that uh, speaking on behalf of my comrades, the first thing that we are fighting for is to get our jobs back. And then um, in terms of solidarity, we are thinking of putting pressure on the employer and uh, the office of the commissioner so that at least this case can be, can be finalized. It's, it has been almost, it's going close to three years that we are still fighting arbitration. And uh, when you look at our labor act, it's very clear. It says the case should be finished within six months. 
uh, with which um, justice delayed is justice denied. Yeah. How can we be fighting for three years almost just to get an arbitration award? It, it's not right. It's not fair. It's not. It's it's it's, it's against. It's, it's against corporate governance. It's against uh, human rights because now at the end of the day, this uh, this uh, process that is delayed is putting us in a in a state that you don't know where you are going because when you apply for jobs and apply for anything, you are marked because people mark you as a troublemaker because you are a union member that stood up for workers' rights, but in the eyes of the employers, you you are seen as a troublemaker, and 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 I and I've seen one of the remarks that the MD made in the in the in the in the arbitration hearing. The MD and the, the chief financial officers they said we are unemployable, and if a if a person from such a high position can say such things, you don't know what damage they have caused you because it's evident enough. If you are applying for jobs, your your applications are turned down. So which means that these people made sure that your 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 future is 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 is, is career suicide. So those are the things that we are fighting for. We want to clear our names. We want Omri to stand by us. We want solidarity in terms of anything that our comrades out there can give us. Uh, Will accept any form of solidarity that can come from the community. Okay, thank, thanks, George. Okay, I guess we're back. Is that it? We seem to have lost connection. Did he want more? I think uh, I, maybe, is it David? Are you connected? Hmm. He's muted, Roger. Yes, I know. Uh, I can see. But... Uh... <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm I'm oh. struggling. Um, I thought I'm saying I'm struggling a little, um, but let's um, you know let's just digest the points. Um, George has made an international appeal. Is uh, there's concrete evidence which we've got uh, in the various resolutions which have been taken at the Durban conference on, on the 1973. Uh, meeting of uh, workers at ILWU and workers internationally. Uh, we want to put that forward uh, to see how we can, you know, take that forward. But let's have debate. Uh, maybe some of the comrades from um, Namibia itself, we hope to have Hewitt present, and other comrades who know quite a lot about the case could uh, come in now. Uh, we, we look forward to contributions maybe from Anna and Steve, who've had quite a lot to do with this uh, particular case. Please uh, put your hand up and then uh, let's see how we can uh, fit in everyone into the debate. Mm. Uh, Steve, would you like to come in? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll come in. So I think we've heard from George uh, about this uh, attack on their union. Uh, and one of the things that's going on internationally is that there's a big campaign uh, to say that Chinese investment is progressive. It's uh, the, the, the global south against the global north. Uh, that's an argument uh, some supporters of China and, and Russia are putting forward. Um, the struggle against U.S. imperialism means that we have to unite the, the global south. Now, I think as uh, Patrick has stated, this investment by China, and China is the largest exporter of capital in the world, 
uh, is uh, actually uh, aimed at uh, getting resources out of uh, the countries that they uh, invest in and also taking over ports around the world. And it's not unique. What happened in um, uh, Greece where they took a Piraeus, they took over the port of Piraeus, Costco, and then they attempted to bust the union. So, uh, and that's one of the reasons KKE, the, the unions in, in Greece are against uh, the privatization uh, with uh, uh, Chinese companies. So I think what, what we have in Namibia is uh, uh, a situation where not only are the uh, Chinese have taken over uh, the Rossi mine, they've taken over all the uranium mines and they've taken over most of the marble uh, mines in Namibia. And not only state companies, but private companies. And they basically want to bust the unions and bring back contract labor. So there's a growth of contract labor uh, that was similar to under the apartheid regime for uh, workers in Namibia, workers in South Africa. And uh, it's a struggle against uh, recolonization. Uh, the SWAPO, the party there has also been corrupted. It's not only Chinese money that's corrupted it. The Icelandic fishing company uh, bought off the Minister of Fisheries, the Minister of Justice, and then took over the, the license, the fishing licenses. So thousands of Namibian fishermen lost their job uh, as a result of the corruption. So the corruption of the governments uh, by foreign capital and by, by the Chinese uh, uh, capitalists have led to a situation in which a break in, total breakdown of, of their labor laws, of their labor rights in the courts. And also the attack, of course, on uh, Haywood Bukes, the uh, lawyer uh, who's been representing them and supporting workers in Namibia. And he's been under attack. They shut off his water and electricity and also got a judgment against him, the Chinese National Nuclear Corporation. So I think for us, we want to build an international campaign. We are building an international campaign for the miners of Namibia and linking it up with the struggle here in the United States with workers and trade unions who are also fighting union busting. So uh, the last point is um, we in the United States are also fighting against xenophobia and racism. And one of the dangers is there's a growth of uh, in the United States attacking Chinese, whipping up a racist campaign against Asians. Uh, in fact, there was a bill 147 in Texas, which outlawed Chinese nationals, North Korean nationals, Iranian nationals, and Russian nationals from even buying land. So if you have dual citizenship, you still you can't buy land. But it turns into a racist campaign. And we have to be clear that the racism and xenophobia against Chinese uh, in Africa is in part a result of uh, the actions of Chinese uh, state companies and Chinese capitalists. I mean, they're contracting out a lot of work and bringing Chinese nationals into Africa to replace African workers, which uh, is, I would say, counter to socialist principles, any kind of labor and worker principles. That's it. Thank you. Comrade Anna. Thanks, Steve. Um, Anna, would you like to come in and uh, could other comrades uh, please prepare? Mm -hmm. Hi, comrades, and thanks to Patrick for that great presentation. Um, I, I keep in touch with the Namibian comrades from time to time. There's not too much more I can add, except that their case um, really exemplifies what happens to, to a union um, when, when one of the state-owned companies from China um, buys a mine. Um, I don't know if you know the background of the Namibian Mine Workers Union. Um, so the, they really, really struggled for decades to get a decent collective agreement there. Um, and then as soon as, almost as soon as the, as the um, China National Nuclear Corporation um, bought the mine, um, they basically, well, they don't recognize the union to begin with. They wanted to do away with the collective agreement. So um, everything like health and safety offices, um, HIV AIDS policies, union meeting rooms, they, they just unilaterally scrapped that. And then they even scrapped um, the pay scale. So they said, um, you know, henceforth, they would just pay the workers on a case by case basis. So it was, it was decades of struggle that they'd had against the previous owners, um, Rio Tinto Zinc, that was just um, undone. And as you heard from um, Comrade George's presentation, they have had really no option but to, to turn to the courts for reinstatement, which has been tough for them because obviously they don't have the money for a, a high price legal team. So they've faced um, repeated postponements for three years. 
Um, and they're now in a desperate situation. I'm not sure if if comrades know. Um, at one point, they were making um, key rings with their photos on, and they were selling them for, I think, about 50 pence each. So they're, they're really... Um, they're really in a very unfortunate situation now. So yes, any any solidarity in organizing that people can do around the 28th of March would be would be good because this of course will be the practice at all other mines. Um and, and Patrick mentioned um the um the activities of of I think private and maybe some state-owned Chinese mining companies in Zimbabwe. So um, that's another issue at the moment with regards to the large lithium deposits. Um, artisanal miners have been banned from, from mining that themselves and then driving up to the border of South Africa and selling it. So the whole, the whole um, situation in Zimbabwe is also being prepared for an influx of, of mines from China. And of course, those will be probably newer mines. So they, they're not unionized, but that's, it's two parts of the same problem, really. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks, Anna. And, and uh, you know, we must commend Anna has done a fantastic job in keeping in touch with the miners and writing art articles, even when uh, the editors have not been particularly keen to see anything critical of Chinese investment. Well done, Anna. Uh, Bob, would you like to come in? Mm. You're muted, Bob. Oh, yes, sorry. Thanks very much, comrades. Well, first of all, I was extremely interested in Patrick's presentation, and I'd appreciate uh, uh, if, if if he's got a written form of his notes, if he could pass them on, because there's a, a real issue, certainly here in the um, uh, uh, in the trade union movement in Britain, uh, there are very strong voices that uh, support the kind of Chinese. Uh, it's a bit like the Japanese Asian co-prosperity uh, co zone, you know, of of the nineteen forties. Um, that that whole drive is uh, gets uh, gets a, a loud voice in our trade union movement here, uh, and it's echoed in the uh, support for various. I mean, to say Zilma Rousseff is running this bloody Chinese bank. Where well, everybody here in the unions is is called upon to support the Workers' Party in Brazil, which is right, of course, because you said they're not a fascist to be running Brazil. But uh, but nevertheless, there are massive illusions in the Workers' Party. Um, so when we were uh, informed about the issues in Rossing, uh, we started work in Britain to um, to give them a voice in the British trade union movement. And there's a comrade who can't be here today. Um, she's very ill. It's a couple of very difficult illnesses. But she managed to get uh, the major trade union here, Unite the Union, to get the London region to support the Rossing comrades and uh, get them some help to uh, found a, 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 an office of the Workers' Advice Centre in Rossing. So we've, we've sort of, as far as we could, concentrated on getting them a voice in the British trade union movement. They spoke to my trades council uh, during lockdown. It was a bit of the way back. And uh, and trying to make sure they had some materials to fight with. Yes, we uh, we had the uh, we had a packet of um, of uh, 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 um, key rings turned up as well. And we sold them where we could. I think we still have one here. Uh, <laughs> but so uh, so that's what we've been trying to do. Um, to uh, to actually get the trade union movement here to confront the question in in Namibia it's not an isolated case the uh, the first issue that was brought to my attention was the Tumeb miners who at the turn of the century had a major strike just before the end of the nineties had a major strike and the the man who is currently president of Namibia was chased by these workers across the felt. Uh, and ran for his life. Uh, but after that, Sumeb Copper Company was uh, liquidated uh, under conditions where there was a sizable pension fund. And funnily enough, all the money has disappeared from that. So there's a major struggle by pensioners, former copper miners. It's still a live struggle, 
because entire families depend on these pensions. Extended families require, re, 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 rely on these pensions. The other one that's a big one is the fishermen in uh, in, in um, on the coast. Uh, there's been absolutely major corruption by foreign fishery companies who bribed ministers and fished way over the uh, the limit and 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 destroyed some fish stocks. At the same time, they rode roughshod over the sailors' uh, uh, rights uh, and trade union rights. And they, they had a general strike of three years on the coast, and they're still fighting for an independent union uh, um, there. So it's not an isolated question, this erosing question. It's, uh, it's, it typifies, it, it's, it really typifies labor relations under this SWAPO government in Namibia. So, yeah. Okay, okay, Bob. Uh, I I I don't know. It's my connection, but I think you've you've been speaking. Could we have other contributions? As as we wait for other contributions, could I make uh, some points? I hope I'm coming over clearly. Uh, um, mm -hmm. You know what we hear. Um, you know, about uh, labor conditions, um, where I heard uh, details of labor conditions in a mine, a gold mining company in Ecuador, uh, in which the all the workers were put on to contract uh, labor, zero contracts, there are contracts, and weekends were abolished. Uh, they do not did not pay workers for a week. You had to work five days, Monday to Friday, and then you had to work Saturday and Sunday to get a weekly wage. Um, and, and other such, you know, developments, which are absolutely, you know, astonishing, uh, beyond belief in a sense, you know, in terms of labor conditions. And then the question rises, how can, um, you know, a state corporation, which is so-called, uh, has a socialist character, uh, right, with Chinese uh, characteristics, <laughs> Uh, uh, you know how can they you know carry out such you know such policies and i think the answer is that the internal regime the way in which conditions for chinese workers where if many of these multinationals are based in china to get ultra low wages uh, but more than that to have contract labor hiring and firing uh, beyond belief that's how, you know, that's the basis for which, you know, uh, the iPhone has been uh, constructed uh, with uh, contracting out all kinds of uh, links in uh, a supply chain uh, to iPhone, which none of which has any trade union representation at all. So it is, it is hard to imagine that when they come to a state in a third world condition, Uh, such as Ecuador and, and Namibia, uh, there's corruption. It's not just corruption to make money, it's a state in their interests, and that's what the Rossing miners are struggling about. They've had a labor action uh, through the courts being delayed for three years, mm. and they've been not able to get any of the legal processes undertaken because the Chinese have actually just bought out the, uh, the regime, the Swapa regime, and the judges as well. Uh, so there's no, you know, we 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 fighting for the workers. We have to put maximum pressure on the uh, arbitrator who's investigating this, and on the Namibian government, the Swapo, you know, government itself, which is under all all kinds of pressure, but is is unrelentless in its anti-worker policies, which, uh, policies which even the Tories couldn't get away with in Britain, but are being carried out by a so-called liberation left government uh, in, mm. in, uh, in South Africa. So there's... So what wider issue here, I'll, I'll just mention also, I think Anna mentioned a terrific labor in Ghana uh, to, uh, you know, to work in, in China and also paying workers an incredible differential between Chinese and local workers between 10 times 
to 15 times uh, the uh, rate of pay for, for African workers. Now, these are unbelievable conditions. Uh, you know, we can, but the problem is, as I think Bob has mentioned, many on the left feel that because China's a socialist state of some kind, uh, that therefore all of this is nonsense. It's a kind of, um, you know, US um, uh, imperialism propaganda or something of that kind. We've got to fight relentlessly with the facts and show what exactly is happening in terms of the lack of, not only the lack of union recognition, but the appalling uh, conditions of labor uh, for workers, you know, in Africa, particularly in Africa, uh, and uh, but also, you know, elsewhere. Um, Anna's mentioned some of the specifics. I was speaking at uh, a group, about 100 workers uh, in Germiston, which is the industrial center of uh, South Africa yesterday. Uh, and uh, everybody is in favor of support for, for rusting miners. We passed... Verbally, we passed a resolution and support of the miners, and that should be coming through uh, to the workers in, in, in the next day. Uh, up the level of support to consulates uh, in, on the 28th on, to decide a case which should have been decided three years ago and decide in favor of the workers. Comrades, uh, I, I think that Patrick's given us a you know, fascinating introduction. I think that we need a further discussion uh, in, in WIN and, and elsewhere in, you know, in, in our forums because the, you know, capital of, of all kinds, whether it's Chinese capital, American capital, is being reconstituted. Markets are being reapportioned uh, at this moment to a quite extraordinary extent uh, as a result of the war in, in Ukraine. Uh, and workers' rights in the, in the third world are really being abused at the same time as we find marvelous uh, Rising of workers in Britain, America, France. Workers are hoping that out their hands and an injury to one is an injury to all, and we'll succeed in our struggles. Uh, could we look for other people to come in? Uh, <clears throat> Uh, please, please, please speak. Yeah. Right. Well, mm. Sorry, I have a bit of a cold, so I might struggle. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm part of a group uh, called Labour Solidarity with Hong Kong. I'm also part of Workers' Liberty here in the UK. Um, and we frequently do sort of protests outside the Apple store, protesting against their use of forced Uyghur labour by the Chinese state, as well as by Foxconn. Uh, we've also done a lot of protests outside the Chinese embassy, protesting for democracy. Um, and it's been amazing seeing a lot, uh, lots of Chinese international students in the UK sort of leading these protests. Um, so I think doing a doing a protest in support of the Namib Namibian workers um, on the 28th of March, that shouldn't be a problem. I think we should definitely do it and we should try and get sort of... Um, Africa solidarity groups uh, involved as well, and you know, try and ask them what they think of the uh, they what they think of the issue. Um, I guess I wanted to know more about Ghana, and I think I missed what was being said about Ghana. Um, what where is it that there's a pay difference between uh, the locals and the Chinese? Um, and uh, I think I think all this stuff about international solidarity for the 28th of March is very good. I wonder if there are particular social media handles that we should be using uh, on the day so that we can all link up? Is there, a, is there a fund, a legal fund that we should be sharing around in advance and at the protest? Um, just bits of administrative stuff like that for the 28th, I guess. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, thanks so much, Sarah. You'll see I've asked your, uh, for your contact details, and I think Steve will help uh, you know, bring together some organizing uh, or coordinating capacity. Um, but uh, let's sum up uh, towards the end and, and bring all those links together. Uh, Dominic, would you like to come in? Mm. We 
We can't hear you. Uh, Dominic, John. please unmute. Yeah. Speak now. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, that's better. Okay. Um, I think I, you know, really appreciated the presentation so far, and it's opened my eyes to just how big an enemy that we're facing in terms of, if you like, international capitalism, whether it be Chinese, whether it be American, or what have you. But what gets me is some of the minor issues that have been brought to light. The fact that an Icelandic fishing company or the Icelandic fishing industry has taken over the Namibian fishing industry. And it's how can we, if you like, bring pressure to bear here in Europe on countries like Iceland and Ireland? Because as far as I understand it, an Irish company has taken over the Senegalese um, fishing industry some years ago because in Ireland the fish the local fishing industry was decimated by uh, if you like accession to the European common market that much of the Irish native fishing industry was destroyed and the situation is one that Iceland itself which has been mentioned in the discussion fought a, a war with Britain over its fishing rights. And now you hear that the Icelandic fishing industry has basically bought off the Namibian fishing industry. And not only is it fishing in, uh, if you like, Namibian waters, but is actually not just tearing up wage agreements with the Namibian workers, but also tearing up all the ecology that goes with fishing, the fact that you need to have a sustainable fishing industry that will be there in years to come to sustain the local population and not going into overfishing and all the other sorts of situations that in, in the short term might bring very big profits, but in the long term will kill the goose that lays the golden egg. And quite frankly, it's how can we get to, if you like, the Namibia, to the Icelandic government. I mean, Iceland, like most of Scandinavia, prides itself on its, if you like, social conscience. And also, as far as Ireland's concerned, <coughs> the fact that Ireland, you know, has seen its fishing industry devastated with accession to the EU and quotas being given to EU fishing, uh, um, if you like, countries, and you know, if you like, destroying what was a thriving, um, you know, local industry. So I'll leave it at that, comrades. I'm sorry, it's only a question, but don't be sorry. Well, we uh, that's what we live on: questions and answers, and uh, thinking through issues. Thanks so much, John. Uh, did we was there a further contribution from your your room? <laughs> Otherwise, Steve, come in. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I'm I'm happy to hear that uh, Sarah uh, is willing to help have an action in London, um, and I think we should try to get those unions that have endorsed the campaign to join the the delegation uh, to the uh, picket in in San Francisco. We got the San Francisco Labor Council to endorse it. Uh, the campaign and against the attack on the Namibian miners. It's an international issue. And I think what we have to develop is direct links between the Namibian workers, the miners, uh, with workers in the United States, workers in Britain, workers around the world. Maybe we can organize it, uh, one of the miners coming from Namibia to Britain, uh, to the United States and do a, do a tour um, and to talk directly to workers what's going on. This is not, this is just the beginning. Uh, as far as Ghana, I mean, I don't have first-hand knowledge, but I, it was reported to me by a professor there that uh, Chinese contract uh, contractors were bringing in actually convict labor into Ghana uh, to do their construction projects. And this is, uh, you know, uh, 
offsourcing of, of, of Chinese convicts into uh, Africa and other countries is a, is a real problem and needs to be exposed. Uh, the other issue, I think, is linking up with the Chinese working class, because as we know, there are no democratic rights for workers in China, and the Chinese government has supported privatization of uh, resources of China, public services, uh, the rust, you know, the, the millions of workers were literally thrown out of their work when they, uh, in the in industrial zone in China, when they got rid of what they call the iron bowl. So um, I think we have to find ways of linking up with the Chinese workers as well. So they're, they're part of this international struggle against the attack on workers' rights. But this day on the 28th can be an important start. And I would ask if you can have an action, even three or four people in front of a consulate in, in, uh, in um, uh, Ireland and, and wh wherever the country, uh, have three or four people with a sign uh, up in front of the consulate, that would be an important step in linking it up and videotaping, audio taping, and making reports of solidarity. That would really help uh, the Namibians as well as financial contributions, uh, which they desperately need. They're in very bad shape. And as they said, they're being blacklisted. They can't work. So they're basically strung out to dry and starve them out. And that's what they've been doing, starving them out so that they don't are, are not able to continue the fight. So we, it's on our shoulders in a large part to help them out and, and build solidarity so they can continue this fight. That's it. Uh, th thanks, Steve. Um, I, 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 I don't see any other contributions at the moment. Could I invite um, Patrick to come in and, uh, on some of the points? I know that you probably have quite a few points in mind, uh, and then you will have the right to sum up at the end, uh, which we look forward to. Patrick, would you like to come in? Mm -hmm. I would, because uh, this international bottom-up solidarity is of enormous importance. And if I think about different ways that um, imperialist, um, say, tools are being used, the, the two interesting examples, um, the gray listing of South African capital, uh, which occurred a couple of weeks ago, which will actually hurt our unpatriotic bourgeoisie, another being the Europeans' um, climate sanctions. We're in a very <clears throat> tricky position because certainly a campus left is sort of, let's say, um, a kind of you know, pro-China and even to some extent we, we, we certainly see in our uh, labor movement in uh, the metal workers and, and in the Communist Party, uh, pro-Putin uh, politics. We are um, then going to also find the, the, the climate sanctions that uh, will be imposed by Europe against South African exports of, of iron, steel, petrochemicals, and uh, automobiles and other highly um, capital-intensive industries to become, you know, quite a, a flashpoint. And so the alternative, uh, which we've always pushed, you know, I think of back in, you know, the late 50s, the, the comrades in, in, in Britain were, you know, cutting edge on on boycotts. And, and it was probably around 62, 63, after uh, too many of our South African nationals were put in jail, that most progressive South Africans said, yeah, we need sanctions. And the dilemma, like I think probably Palestinians fighting uh, so hard against Israel had, had uh, come across by 2005 when they, they pulled their BDS, boycott divestment sanctions together, or when uh, climate change activists got their, uh, what they call divest, invest, the sanctions against investments in, in fossil fuel companies. We really haven't done the hard work to get the solidaristic power that might have actually affect uh, you know, China, for example. Uh, the dilemma is whether uh, we're gonna get uh, a kind of, uh, let me call it the bricks from below or a movement of, of people that typically would meet every year. Some very big organizations involved. So I'll just take 10 seconds to, 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 to pop some, you know, drop some names. Um, I think our most reliable are in the National Alliance of People's Movements, which are you know tens of millions of people that can be mobilized in India. And they've started off against the 
the big dams in the Sardar Sarvar Valley, uh, but they've moved into the cities, and they've been consistently clear that Modi is their enemy, and that we need we need the sort of you know bottom up politics. A second is the uh, uh, groups that are more connected to the campus, uh, as I say, pro China, but also to some extent pro Putin policies. And there, I would mention the metal workers, National Union metal workers, uh, a year or so ago actually formally endorsed BRICS and um, and Putin and even more coal. So it's a very thorny problem there because it's the biggest union. Uh, another big group is the Brazilian movement of landless workers, and they've often come up in as a sort of put it a kind of campus way, pro-China. So I look at this terrain which we're on, that um, the role of this bottom-up labor solidarity is absolutely vital. And the last time we did a BRICS from below, that was in Hong Kong, it was in 2017. You might remember that the BRICS were hosted by Xi for the first time in China that year. And uh, they met in Xiamen. So they had this kind of great, you know, party in their resort area, Xiamen, a, a nice uh, sort of, you know, East, East Coast site. But at the same time, we met with the Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions and Globalization Monitor and uh, Borderless Hong Kong, a left movement there. And we had maybe 300 people out there uh, trying to find that same kind of solidarity uh, with the bricks from below. We didn't have the full array of our forces. And this is the unevenness that I would anticipate we're going to see in Durban in August. 22 to 24 is the BRICS uh, summit. But what you start doing now is going to very clearly, I think, guide many of us and guide some of our better trade unions. I mean, Anima Jabu is very connected into some of these unions. Uh, one of them is the big federation called South African Federation of Trade Unions, SAFTU, which I will probably, you know, maybe I'll be wrong, but, you know, predict that they'll come out with a, a good position on everything from the BRICS, you know, in China, down to the solidaristic way they can relate to Rusing uh, uranium miners. Another would be the General Industrial Workers Union uh, of South Africa, Gawusa, very strong ideologically. But there are not that many of these left forces and what you're able to do internationally well i think help to spur and to provide the example if i conclude with one or two sites you know we, we saw trade unions fight uh western uh, multinational capital in the form of big pharma in the early 2000s where uh, aids medicines were at stake and getting them to be generic not branded to get them to be supplied by our, our, our government, not by, you know, private uh, suppliers. And that was a success because of international solidarity, uh, to be precise, uh, ACT UP in the US and uh, Medicine Sans Frontier. Now, those experiences, uh, I could add half a dozen others, water privatization, fees must fall of students. Um, there have been numerous micro struggles in which international uh, solidarity was, was critical here. Um, and those give us that sense that historically, we've done quite well on bottom up, you know, labor, community, environmental, feminist, uh, LGBTQI, lots of movements that have found those solidaristic relationships. What I don't think we've done particularly well here, and I can give you lots of, you know, tragic and, and heartbreaking examples. I mean, the last one was the last couple of weeks with with Burma, with the comrades in Burma who desperately need uh, South Africa to, to line up against uh, the Myanmar junta, the army junta. But I could go on and on. But we haven't really found a way to do um, anti-sub-imperial solidaristic work particularly well. I can say this from Johannesburg with confidence. I've tried my best with, with those Mo Mozambican uh, uh, you know, comrades who don't want to see gas extracted or or islamic guerrillas moving up uh, you know all the all the dilemmas that we have with the character of our of our uh, resistance so my final word and and you know i don't think I, I need a final word after this david is um what you're doing internationally what you started doing especially from britain in the 50s many of you comrades in the u.s from you know your dock worker support that steve and, and uh, david were organizing in the 70s and uh, the the anti-apartheid and and then also linking Palestine, uh, the U.S., uh, Britain, and and South Africa into BDS support. Uh, this is really the future of of solid international politics. Uh, I'll hope to see you at the Chinese embassy on the twenty eighth. I wish I could say I was going to be in Pretoria or at the consulate in Durban or the consulate in Cape Town, but I think I might see you in London, where I'll happen to be. Uh, thanks, comrades. So we say Amanda. Away to.
Aman, <laughs> and, and great to uh, hear that, uh, Patrick. Uh, look, um, I don't see many other many hands up uh, right now on the general and the specific. The roasting miners are really struggling. I I was quite, I would say, quite humbled uh, to hear George uh, speaking and. There's a tone of desperation at, at times there because three years is a long time uh, when you do not have support. And the, you know, I, I don't think they've had the kind of support that the union should have given them, uh, you know, a, a, at all. And, uh, you know, we have a ruthless employer and it does it does wear you down. So we do need messages of support. I put forward a message of support from from Win our, our network. Uh, we should have one of our mining uh, comrades, you know, to follow that uh, follow that through. Sarah, you've done some marvelous uh, work in the past. It seems you know it's great to hear the work that you're doing, and certainly I think the comrades in London should link up uh, because it's not just you know one ones or twos. It seems that we could have quite a few more. Uh, it would be marvelous if we could do this and, and show to the uh, Chinese bureaucracy that they are not ruling over the workers and able to exploit them in the way in which they think they can. Uh, we we should uh, get uh, Sarah. I think you could come in on, on the wind debate um, uh, network uh, so that your you could, uh, you know, address appeals to to win comrades, uh, you know, everywhere. Uh, and Steve, I think, has got a few ideas in terms of getting the comrades mobilized in the United States. And certainly, um, well, I'll be approaching unions. And uh, I was addressing the Casual Workers Advice Office in Germiston, which is a very lively uh, group um, of young workers, uh, real activists. They're a little bit far away from Pretoria. I forgot how far it was away, you know, the, the Germiston uh, from Johannesburg. Uh, but, you know, we do expect that uh, if we make an appeal to comrades who've previously been with us, um, you know, so like comrades of, I, of the uh, General Industrial Workers Union of South Africa, I've spoken to John uh, Polis, he's the General Secretary, he's prepared to give support. So look, we, we, we're developing, a, you know, a head of steam here, and it does look uh, really good. Uh, I think what I'll do now is if there are no further contributions, let's look to uh, pursuing the issue. But I would ask for Roger to come in and to uh, speak to the issues that have been raised and, and uh, you know, give us an idea of what's coming up in the future. I want to say before we, we close, Patrick, a marvelous uh, contribution. You've got so much uh, there that, uh, you know, it'll take a, a while to, you know, for the uh, comrades to absorb. Let's pass on the uh, links. I know that you do have quite a few links uh, for the general education of, of everybody, particularly on the BRICS counter-revolution, uh, which is what it seems like an assembly of, uh, you know, there as well as, uh, you know, an assembly around the United States imperialism. Uh, we want neither. We've got to develop the working class position on all of these uh, issues. Uh, Roger, would you like to come in? Mm. Uh, yes. Um, really, Hi, welcome I to was... the analysis.news. I'm Paul Jay. Um, we're going to talk about... Sorry, is somebody... If somebody else wants to speak first, I'm no problem. No, okay. Uh, well, I, I... I think... I think there was a haphazard something happened. Roger, please go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, comrades, uh, I I uh, was absolutely spellbound by some of the information that we uh, that we heard today from from the comrades, from Patrick and other comrades, and from George. Um, I didn't have anything to say in the discussion because um, I was you know this is all new information for me. But I think all of us were horrified to hear about the brutality, the utterly uh, ruthless um, uh, behavior of the uh, of the Chinese uh, regime and Chinese companies. And um, I, the only kind of general point I'd like to make about this is that we have a complete blind spot in the labor movement in Britain and internationally. Uh, both in relation to Russia and uh, in relation to China, 
Um, I mean, I don't want to verge onto other issues, but it, we've seen that, in, for instance, in relation to the um, to the Ukraine war, that we see that the left has been divided on the one side to a pro NATO position of simply uh, of simply um, uh, abandoning any kind of criticism or any kind of independent position uh, in relation to the actions of um, NATO and uh, the uh, Western imperialism. But at the same time, we also see another another wing, if you like, of the left, who don't seem to have even noticed that, the, um, that, that there's been a counter-revolution in Russia and that we have a gangster kleptocracy in power there and uh, who feel that they have some kind of obligation to defend uh, Russia as somehow a little more progressive, or at least as some kind of pole of uh, opposition to the to um, uh, an imagined main enemy. Um, and we'll see that even more with China, because the Ukraine war is only a, um, a, a sort of um, overture uh, and a preparation for a later war and a later confrontation with China, and we're going to see. I mean, what, what, from what um, from some of the uh, information that we've got today, we can see that there's going to be sections of the left and of the labour movement that have a complete myopia and don't understand that the Chinese regime ruthlessly and mercilessly exploits the workers of China and the workers of uh, all those um, countries in which it has established um, a base now. And uh, you know, Namibia should be an object lesson and a real model to, uh, to comrades and to the movement generally in showing what a, what a um, horrible um, enemy to the working class the Chinese regime uh, is. So I just wanted to, to make that point. Certainly we would... Um, uh, participate in any activities that are that are being planned and I'm very glad to hear that um, Patrick is coming to London because I hope that we can meet uh, we'll meet at the uh, Chinese embassy and perhaps um, perhaps um, uh, uh, you know in the days around that too and we can discuss that further so I'll just finish on that point comrade thanks Sorry, and, and any news on the next week's discussion, Roger? Mm. Oh, uh, yes, I thought maybe uh, Patrick was going to come back. Do you, do you want to say anything first, Patrick? Yes, Patrick, you know, you're, no, you're denying covered, yourself the right to reply. There's, there's no, no reply, no reply. <laughs> this is just uh, solidarity. Thanks, guys. Oh, well, um, in that case, <laughs> uh, I'm afraid that... Uh, we I can't tell you yet what we'll be discussing next week. We did have something planned, which has fallen through, uh, and um, of course, as usual, no, that, we'll be getting that's fine. We're we'll getting information, uh, uh, you know, by email. Uh, I can tell you that in uh, two weeks' time, uh, I'm very pleased to say that we've got uh, Michael Roberts to speak about the. Um, financial crisis which is uh, unfolding at the present time and which could be could have absolutely cataclysmic um, effects on all of us so that's in two weeks time for next week please just watch this space uh, Anna has her hand up Anna has her hand up look I think Anna wanted the last point uh please come in anna mm. oh sorry i just wanted to say i sent um the latest version anna, of the um, unmute. Oh. yeah i'm not i'm not muted carry can on hear i can hear you <laughs> oh thank you okay I've sent go ahead i sent the latest version of the pamphlet to the chat sorry uh correct steve i think you had a, a previous yep. version yep thank you yeah okay yeah <laughs> no that's great so sarah we look forward to working with you and uh, for what what it seems, uh, quite an appreciable group now uh, coming to the Chinese embassy on the 28th. 
uh, which is absolutely marvelous. Comrades, many thanks for the contribution from all sides. Uh, we I've been quite actively in touch uh, with the Namibian comrades and you know in the last few minutes to see if we could get more contributions. I think the uh, you know there are as you hear from me quite a few challenges in Wi-Fi and elsewhere. But we do, so do need to have direct links is what we want. We want to hear the direct voice of the workers in, you know, in our discussions and, and tied up together with a broader theoretical uh, outline we are developing internationally. So thanks, everybody, really focused, and we look forward to the discussion next week. Uh, Dominic. Has okay, sorry, uh, Dominic, please come in. If you, yeah. just, just a practical question. I think the question of sending donations to the, the workers in Namibia, you know, has been raised and it's it's a question of can somebody circulate some details or is it going to be a central collection point? Because I think when we were sending money to the uh, workers in South Africa, we had, you know, there was a bit, we had a bit of a problem getting the bank details. You, know, you need the full international transfer details. So is it up to individuals or is there going to be some central collecting point to do it all together from Wynn? And the other point is the question of these documents about the struggle of the workers there. Can they be circulated through the email system uh, so that we can raise this where we can? Bob, Bob is as, as Bob, great, great points. Yep. Sorry, come in. Can I, Above, yeah. Thanks a lot. The, on those two points from Dominic, um, first of all, I, I can pass on to Roger um, a number of a number of papers that the uh, the uh, Rossing uh, Union leaders produced, and in their attempt, you know, they might be a bit dated because they've in fact not achieved some of the things they wanted to achieve but they did they did put forward quite a serious plan so I'll, I'll if i pass that to roger could he circulate the the link to everybody that's yeah, the sure. first point secondly the the money question is absolutely bamboozling and we've um we've quite often when we've sent money to namibia it's it's extremely difficult um and sometimes we've sent it to a third party to pass on because that go, that's worked a bit easier. But it is extremely difficult. And uh, nevertheless, if anybody seriously wants to make a donation, let me know and I'll, I'll work out a way of doing it. Sorry, great, that's it. great to hear, Bob. Uh, could I mention that Anna has written two or three articles uh, on the current uh, Rossing uh, uh, miners' issues. And I know that there's further updates, um, you know, to be made. And, of course, we want to have the very latest uh, details when the workers are entering into the arbitration uh, process or the, the, you know, and the labor courts. Uh, so, look, we will be circulating that in, uh, on, you know, in the WIND debate, on the WIND Facebook uh, and elsewhere. I think Dominic, do you had a hand up again? Mm. Just a small detail, but could when you're sending Bob, when you're sending the documents to uh, Roger, could you also send your contact details so as you can circulate yeah. those? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, now we got Roger come in. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I've just got to say in relation to uh, to next week. Um, as um, David has indicated, we did invite German comrades to speak, but and they will be speaking on the situation in Germany at a future meeting. But they said that next week uh, they probably would not be able to make it. So that's why we have a, uh, a gap. Now, um, we've never done this before, but perhaps we should have done. Is there anybody here who would like to volunteer to, to speak and to lead off a discussion next week? If so, uh, either tell us now or put it in the chat or contact me uh, as, as soon as possible. Uh, we will we will come up with something, but I mean, if anybody here wants to volunteer, we'd be very, very uh, grateful.
Leave it. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. I oh. even think of having a discussion of Brazil, but look, let, let me not raise too many red herrings. <laughs> you know, let's just see. Um, and we'll be in touch, Roger. Okay. Um, thanks, thanks, ones and all. As uh, it's it's quite often the case that we conclude a discussion, but there's a lot more <laughs> discussion that arises as we try and conclude. So thank you all for participating. Thank particularly uh, Patrick. That's marvelous, and thanks for Anna too, who's done an enormous amount of work in in relation to Rossing and to Steve. Uh, all that work is appreciated, and it will have its rewards. Thank you, comrades. Mm. Thank you. Okay, thanks, comrades.